and welcome to the Energy and Sustainability webinar, Energy as a Service. My name is Nicole Matthews, and I'll be available to assist with most technical issues that may arise. If you experience a technical problem, please send a message through the Q&A box, or you can email at nmatthews at sme.org. Lastly, you can call WebEx directly at 1-866-779-3239. As I turn over the webinar to our moderator, Jamie Link, you'll see a brief poll appear. Please take a moment to answer the questions. Thank you for your participation. Go ahead, Jamie. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Society of American Military Engineers, I would like to welcome you to the webinar, Energy as a Service. I'm Jamie Link, Associate Director for Business Development at EDF Renewable Energy, and I will be your host for today's webinar. I also serve on SAME's Energy and Sustainability Subcommittee, which is sponsoring this webinar today. As Nicole mentioned, I wanted to alert you that we have a poll open for you. You'll see a pop-up box on the right-hand side of your monitor. Please go ahead and answer these few quick questions to help us tailor the presentation to the audience. SAME is a leader in energy and resilience. Through active engagement with military engineers and industry, SAME provides the platform to identify capability gaps and a forum for collaboration and integration to address the military engineers' most pressing energy and resilience issues. Through SAME's active engagement, the safety, surety, and security of the military's built infrastructure is regularly being evaluated and discussed with a focus on improving our national security. In an effort to engage industry members of SAME, we have planned this webinar, Energy as a Service. We hope that the information presented will be useful in evaluating opportunities to implement holistic energy solutions for federal customers. Energy as a Service is a concept developed in response to the federal government's aggressive pursuit of holistic energy solutions for its facilities, solutions that encompass energy efficiency, energy resiliency, clean generation, and energy storage. Following the webinar, the presentation will be emailed to all attendees within three business days. Please keep an eye out for a follow-up email containing the presentation, PDH certificate, and a link to a recording of this webinar. This webinar would not be possible without our presenter, Lucian Niemeyer, so I would like to sincerely thank him for his participation today. Lucian has taken a lead role in analyzing legislative avenues for achieving energy as a service in order to facilitate implementation at federal facilities. I would also like to thank each of you for joining us today. I'm looking forward to the presentation and to your questions afterward. I encourage each of you to send in your questions as they arise. You can type questions in the WebEx Q&A chat box and submit to all panelists. We will answer as many questions as time permits during the live webinar. After this webinar, you will be automatically routed to a survey page. Please participate in this short poll so that we can address any concerns for future webinars. I'd now like to introduce our speaker. Lucian Niemeyer is an independent consultant, recently retired from 11 years of service on the United States Senate Armed Services Committee. Prior to his service in the Senate, Lucian served 21 years in the U.S. Air Force. Without further ado, I will pass this call over to Lucian. Hey, Jamie, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, my, my sincere thanks to uh, SAME for setting this up today. I think it offers a fantastic uh, opportunity for us to discuss an emerging um, uh, process, or method, emerging method of delivery, which I think will be very beneficial for the federal government and to the Department of Defense. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, know my background, uh, I did serve 11 years on the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, which is a uh, on the professional staff, and one of my portfolio items was uh, energy policy, defense energy policy, defense energy processes. So I left the committee a couple years ago, worked with Jamie on uh, trying to figure out how do we move the ball forward on this particular uh, method of providing, I, I believe, a very exciting method of providing and addressing energy needs for the Department of Defense and federal government uh, writ large. What I'm going to cover today is uh, the following, and I really would also like to, to make sure you all understand that uh, please don't uh, necessarily hold your questions at the very end. 
Uh, I think Jamie's giving me a look and those over, and I don't mind being interrupted as we go through the presentation. If you've got a question specifically on a, on the slide that we're currently talking about or, or an issue, so um, I will. We will have a question and answer period at the end, but feel free also to chime in during. And, and Jamie, I hope you'll bring some of those questions up to us as we're going along. Um, I don't necessarily want to spend too much time uh, describing what energy as a service is uh, as far as the commercial sector. It's a process and it's a method of delivery which has been pretty uh, popular and well used in Europe, um, not as much by U.S. companies or in the U.S. market, but I believe there's a lot of folks out there, and, and to, starting off with uh, Inter uh, uh, Edison International, uh, there are a lot of uh, companies out there that are really looking at uh, how do we apply this to the American market. Uh, you can go online, there's been an explosion of uh, articles and discussion about how, to, how we can use this particular process um, to serve the needs of both private and public clients. Um, also, um, using service contracts is also something which is not necessarily unique, but is growing within the Department of Defense. Uh, and another entirely uh, other sector, the DOD is really looking at uh, data centers as a service and other, other types of infrastructure and commodities as a service. So I don't necessarily want to focus in on how the processes uh, it, it, or can be done for, the, for those processes or for energy. I want to really focus in on what specifically can DOD do given existing authorities, what has been reaching congressional concerns, where do we look like where we might be able to save e either dollars or effort or address emerging requirements for energy security. So a large part of this presentation will be going over some of the emerging concerns that require an infrastructure investment and to what degree energy as a service might be the way to get that done without necessarily having to rely on other methods of, of acquisition or, or funding such as MILCON, SRM, and other things. If I use an acronym uh, that anybody does not understand during the presentation, please uh, jot me a note and I'll go ahead and explain that too. Okay, so a real quick overview, $4 billion spent a year um, to, to uh, and, and this briefing is tailored predominantly to DOD, um, $4 billion spent annually uh, at, uh, at 500 million translations in the United States. Um, most of the energy policy emerging in the last 10 to 15 years has been centered around conservation and increased use of renewable sources. Um, and I, I don't necessarily see that abating. I, I believe ultimately uh, we will continue to want to find locations, particularly with the goal to go towards more distributed generation, uh, figure out where is the best locations for renewables. Um, I do believe energy is a service for it to move forward to the Department of Defense, probably would need to concentrate on one of the most, what are the most effective and efficient local generation, power generation methods as opposed to emphasizing one generated mission, mission or, or another. Uh, but right now, current DOD policy is really work in trying to um, uh, uh, get the market stimulated um, for renewable source generation. So a real quick overview of, of where exactly and who is buying energy right now and, and, and breakdown by department. Um, a lot of these charts you'll see are pulled from the link at the bottom, which I would highly recommend anybody uh, wanting to find out more information about the current DG position. The link at the bottom is actually an annual energy management report, which is put out by the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and uh, you'll be able to link the most recent one. So most of this uh, data that we're providing for this presentation has been updated from the presentation that Jamie and I gave at JETSI in May. Um, and, and also, by the way, um, if there's anybody who uh, has any uh, critical concerns about this presentation, feel free to uh, disparage me in person. I'll be at the Small Business Conference uh, down in, uh, in um, Atlanta in November, so I look forward to seeing you all down there. Uh, but for, for the time being, uh, the data you're seeing here, the charts you're seeing are the most up-to-date we've got for the Department of Defense. Just for a quick review, too, and I won't go through all these, the Department of Defense does have a wide range of authorities available to them for some pretty innovative things. Um, probably one of the most innovative authorities that the rest of the federal government wish they had was uh, 2922A, which allows for long-term contracts up to 30 years for, to that would allow for partnerships 
for the construction of generation plants on military installations and the provision of energy that comes from those plants. Uh, that is something that uh, probably the rest of the federal government would love to have. Uh, right now, it's a uh, it's a strictly a DOD authority. Uh, I will say that um, we are in a climate right now in federal government. If we were to try to get an additional authorities, uh, we would have a problem with uh, the process known as OMB scoring or, or federal scoring, where many of these authorities were were put in the on law prior to a more stringent look at how these authorities might play out or affect federal budgets. So there's been a lot of common discussion about okay, what do we just how would just we just add new authorities? Uh, what you'd run up against is either a concern of scoring the impact of that provision, which may end up being the billions of dollars and therefore unaffordable in a current budget climate, um, or or, a, or or implementing the authority and then having OMB score the projects um, to the point where it becomes unaffordable for a federal agency. A lot of that's happening right now with uh, with civilian infrastructure. Some of the authorities that are in the WARDA bill are not able to be used by the Corps of Engineers because OMB is scoring those projects at a very high cost that makes it very affordable for either the Corps or anybody to carry those through in annual appropriations. So the authorities that exist, uh, when Jamie and I have been looking at this, really is we can't necessarily assume that we can get a new authority. We have to figure out what potentially can we do with energy service within the existing authorities we already have. I'm going to run through real quick, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the next couple of slides just to make sure we have common definitions, what right now we're calling critical energy requirements and what energy resilience is. Specifically, the second term, I want to make sure in the context that we're using it today, um, it really applies from mission assurance. It applies to mission assurance, not necessarily resilience in the face of global climate change or changing conditions or sea level rises. That's another definition of resilience that the federal government, and particularly this administration, is using. I'm concentrating on energy resilience as it applies to the ability of military services to carry out their missions and operations. You do have a lot of recent uh, guidance coming out uh, from OSD uh, as a result of resiliency. Um, some of the biggest concerns really has been uh, raised um, more uh, by the Director of National Intelligence, uh, who has testified in both closed session and open session before Congress over the last few years, that he believes one of the most critical national security threats facing our nation is the long-term takedown of the commercial power grid. And this is something that we've, we've known about for a while, but it has really, uh, the, 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 the support, or the, I should say the support, the, the specter of the threat has been um, elevated over the last couple of years in, in, in testimony by the Director of National Intelligence. Um, as a result, the military services just this year, 2016, have embarked on renewed efforts to figure out where they are at right now with their energy projects and what degree they can apply some of the capital improvements um, towards um, in, uh, energy security. The concern is, uh, currently is many of the energy projects, particularly for renewable generation, that are being pursued by the military services don't, don't directly tie back to being able to power critical functions on a military base. They're building it, but it goes right into the grid, and, and the equipment, the storage, the switch gear is, at this point, not part of the deal or too expensive. That is what we are maybe trying to solve or asking the services to take a look at with energy as a service, where you might be able to apply some of the buying power of that particular initiative to address some of the emerging energy security needs on military installations. Traditionally, DOD has relied on generators, um, portable generators, and that's something that DOD will continue to rely on, um, but as everybody who's ever been who's ever worked on a military base knows those generators can be unreliable, um, they require constant service, and ultimately they have a limited supply of fuel that if we were to have a regional or a large take down the commercial power grid, trying to get diesel fuel or other types of fuel for the generators would, would be very difficult. So that is why the department now is looking at, okay, what other power sources other than generators could we use to improve energy resilience on military bases?
Another program that's not widely understood is the Energy Conservation Investment Program. The reason why I bring it up in this context is it could serve as a capital contribution to any kind of a deal energy as a service. If you go back and look at uh, the uh, previous use of private, uh, of private event, uh, capital uh, by the military, which is the Military Housing uh, Privatization Program, in many cases, those deals, in order to be solvent, in order to be acceptable for the performance to work, needed a contribution of military construction funds. Not a lot of folks understand that, but that's just ultimately what we had to do, whether it be 10 million, 30 million, 40 million, uh, many of the deals did require a one-time shot of capital improvement. The reason why I bring this program up in this context is that there might be the need in the future to take a look at a PPA or a USSC a, a service contract and combine it with ESIP or, or other types of authorities and be able to provide a performer that truly addresses uh, the, the uh, providing energy service all the way from generation to the uh, building meter on a military base. And, in that, and also to include the installation potentially of microgrids where needed. The, the reason why also I bring this program up is Congress made a change in the 2017 Defense Authorization Act, which we're waiting to see will, if it will be in the conference report, um, to allow this particular account to be used for energy security needs, not necessarily just based on a payback um, over time for energy conservation, but to address purely energy security needs that may not necessarily have a short-term payback. And then the program, uh, the, uh, the DOD energy program, which has seen the most amount of effort in the last, uh, uh, say, seven or eight years, is using uh, service contracts, um, uh, energy savings performance contracts, and power purchase agreements to uh, work on the goals and the priorities of, of the current administration, which is they've been used mostly for conservation, um, energy, uh, energy savings, obviously, but PPAs have been used to um, incentivize industry to construct or to install or to establish renewable energy generation. Um, and so what you've seen a real push by DOD over the last four or five years is deals that work in that direction with those priorities. Another program that DOD has and, and, for the, uh, and has been well known for many years is the idea of utilities privatization. Utilities privatization, depending on which service, has either been not successful at all or relatively successful or generally successful. Um, it was established by Congress with the understanding that military construction and, and O&M uh, operations and maintenance um, investments in on-base utility systems were not at the level that could adequately maintain service and, and, and be modernized and maintain actually the secure and reliable service to military facilities. Congress allowed the DOD to consider uh, using third-party investments to upgrade on-base distribution systems. Therefore, the Utilities Privatization Authority allows for the conveyance of the on-base system to a private entity for which then, in exchange for a higher rate or a rate of service, they can uh, address the capitalization needs of the uh, on-base distribution system. Um, again, it's had, it's had a moderate success. In the past few years, this particular program has seen a reduction of effort um, due for two reasons, mainly the complexity, the com complexity of the deals, particularly working through DLA as a contracting agent, has been difficult to, to, to manage. Uh, some deals take three to five years. But more importantly is a lot of the manpower that was working on utilities privatization has shifted over towards um, trying to uh, work contracts for PPAs and, and ESPCs. In other words, you only have a finite amount of manpower in the Department of Defense, and a lot of that's been shifted over to the priorities that this current administration feels are, are more conducive to, to long-term security for our country. Um, I do believe personally that um, as we look at, again, a constrained budget environment, that we are going to see a, an emphasis or a renewed emphasis and to what degree the privatization of on-base utilities can assist the Department of Defense on being more efficient and more effective, particularly if you combine it with the other authorities, and that's really what we're talking about right now is combining all these authorities into one RFP uh, to provide energy as a service. 
Also a quick update on the DOD metering program, which would be, from my perspective right now, the endpoint for energies of service doesn't certainly mean we could not continue past the meter into a military facility with one of these RFPs, but I think right now, if we were to work with the department, we would want to focus on just from power generation up to the meter, but uh, with that, we want to incorporate whatever we have right now for DOD metering program. Those of us who have been watching this program know that there were mandates to install meters to install smart meters, but we're still having an issue with what to do with the data and the next step for data management and how we actually apply it to more efficient management of our facilities. I think that's where energy as a service could come in and play a primary role in, in, in solving that problem as well. And again, going over what DOD is faced with, uh, you can see the range of DOD guidance um, that has been proliferated over the years. Um, a lot of it's been updated in the last five or six years, but for a base level facility energy manager, it's pretty daunting to see everything they've got to be working on a day-to-day -day basis. And bottom line, from all these mandates and all this guidance, um, the services are, for the most part, and the, and the chart, I'm sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy here, that was, that's the, uh, that's left, that's, that was actually transferred over from the energy management report, but if, uh, if the, the numbers that we're showing right now for goals, some services are doing well in some goals, uh, some services aren't doing well in other goals, but more importantly is the concern that a lot of folks have, and I'll get to that here in a minute, that maybe we need to be looking at other types of goals that more, more towards um, security as opposed to conservation. And, uh, and, 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 and allow the services to redirect some of their energies and attention. Okay, so real quick, I want to shift over to what Congress is saying. And I'm going to, the next few slides uh, are excerpts from congressional reports um, that have been provided as guidance to the Department of Defense. Um, really looking at a, a couple of issues. To what degree electricity reliability um, uh, and, and outages have on military missions and installations? And the numbers are kind of mixed. If you really look at it across the board, particularly if you look at the most recent energy management report, today we don't necessarily have too much of a problem outside of the national disasters of, of outages that, um, that are, I cannot, can be quickly um, uh, resolved. And that was predominance, predominance of the outages the military installations and military missions have in this country last no more than a day or two um, and don't have a significant impact on military missions. Um, what we're looking at is what might be the threat down the road for a much longer term outage um, that would um, well, cause huge problems for our country, but definitely um, significant issues for maintaining our national security. If you look at this year's defense authorization bill from both the House and the Senate side, they've got a little bit more focused in what they are asking the department to do. In this specific case, they're asking the department to leverage, leverage and integrate existing authorities um, to work towards the goal of resilient, available, reliable power. And I think this is really getting the heart of where we think energy as a service uh, might be the way to solve that particular issue and to address that particular concern. Sorry, I'm going to go back to the slide and skip the slide. Technical error here. All right. Which we have in response to congressional concern and the need by uh, the services to start addressing um, uh, uh, issues about the uh, uh, long-term power outages is you do have some services stepping out. Um, since our presentation in May, we've seen the Air Force take, take a very aggressive uh, posture on going out there and seeing what can be done. Um, one initiative is called the, uh, the Ready Initiative. Uh, the RFP was putting out in, in June. Uh, it closed on July, I'm sorry, it's an RFI, uh, put out in June for a closure on July 15th. And it really starts asking the questions, what can be done in this case, Beale Air Force Base, what can be done 
um, and looking for ideas from industry, what can be done to look at Beale Air Force Base emissions on Beale and to improve, overall, overall improve the reliability, the efficiency, and the clean use of energy for that particular installation. The Air Force specifically identifies uh, three requirements that have to be met, and, and that's what they're looking for right now. They're in the process right now of, of reviewing those comments that came in from industry and making the determination whether they believe they can go out with an RFP and our request for proposals in the near future to take the next step towards a, a ready initiative that could ultimately be applied not to Beale, but also to other Air Force bases around the country. At the bottom there, if you need more, like to have more information specifically on that, on that RFI, I've got a link there um, that you can uh, take a look at and that'll give you everything you want to know about the background of Beale and what the Air Force is trying to get done. We also have the Army Security and Sustainability Strategy, and they've, they've stepped up recently too, particularly in response to General Milley's concern about to what degree Army's missions would be affected by a long-term power outage, and they've been working energy security assessments around the country this year. They've actually started last year and determining to what degree critical Army installations are vulnerable to, the, uh, to long-term grid outages and what can be done over the short term and long and mid term to mitigate those uh, those uh, uh, concerns. They are very the Army is very proud of the fact that they do have one base, uh, Fort Drum in New York, um, that through the successful execution of a PPA um, for biomass and the recent tests where they can com come completely off the commercial power grid and operate independently all critical uh, functions on the base. Um, that to them is a step forward, and they are looking for opportunities around the Army where they can duplicate that um, without regard to what power source. And I know there's some, there is some efforts on the part of the Army to take a look at natural gas, um, where that might be able to be um, incorporated into a distributed energy plan um, for, for, for remote energy generation that could be fed into an on-base smart grid that could pro provide power and have, the, and have offtake from that particular power plant um, sent into the grid, a commercial power grid, as a, as a way to pay back or to, or to amortize the capitalization of that power plant. I know the Army is looking at a couple locations. So they're just now starting to, to get started on, on that part, not necessarily energy as a service, but what degree they can take the power of a PPA and point it inward towards um, the construction and the capitalization of on-base infrastructure to give them that ability to island or to come off the commercial power grid if they had to. So, Really what you're looking at today, and, and unfortunately a, a lot of these initiatives are starting at, have to start at the installation. And what a installation energy manager is faced, a manager is faced with today is a whole series of challenges. Uh, most of all being that there currently does not exist the operations and maintenance funding nor the MILCON funding to carry out some of the projects and some of the initiatives that might be required to achieve a higher level of resiliency and flexibility in the electrical system. Uh, the, and a lot of times the tools they have um, are disjointed or in any way, or in some cases stovepiped, whereby they might want to use the power of an ESPC or the power of a PPA, but it's tough for them to, to look at ways at their level, the garrison level or the installation level, to figure out a way to combine authorities. And, and so really they're more reactive as opposed to being proactive. So that's why we're proposing today, and we've been working on this with the Department of Defense, that DOD needs to look at, at the DOD level, not necessarily at the garrison level or the installation level, but at a higher level to what degree existing authorities that they have already can be combined um, to provide energy as a service to one or more military installation. So we're at its core, what, and the Air Force is taking a look at this right now, is one contract that uses a long-term power purchase agreement for a 30-year uh, uh, schedule or plan, um, or, or a service, a utility service contract as a base transaction, but incorporates, um, if needed, ESPC, although it probably have a limited authority, 
um, if needed, enhanced use leasing authority, um, if, only if you needed to, to do generation on a military base. But more importantly, the uh, authority of utilities privatization that would allow the DOD to, to transfer assets and the potential contribution of ESIP dollars to address very unique and specific capitalization requirements like the installation of a microgrid. The way I envision this, and I've been watching these contracts for the last 10 years, is we envision it more as a base looking at, okay, I've got an on-base distribution system which has deteriorated. I know I've got the potential or I have a need to look at ways to become more secure and more independent from the commercial power grid. Let me see what I can do with a 30-year contract that would allow us to address all those issues, have somebody come onto a base, make a call for me whether I need to upgrade my on-base distribution system or to, can I just go ahead and go straight to the installation of a microgrid? What is the most efficient and effective way to get this done? And more importantly, what's the most effective way to fund it? And that's where the idea of a 30-year 30, 30 deal that allows for a higher rate over time that will help fund whatever improvements might be needed on the base right now. And that's really what, if you go back and look at the history of the housing privatization program for DOD, it really wasn't a matter of trying to be more effective in providing houses. It was a, it was a matter of trying to get the investments in those houses, houses accelerated um, uh, beyond trying to wait for traditional military construction. And that's what we have in this case. We have a compelling national security need that requires a innovative and out-of-the-box acquisition solution that will allow investments um, in utilities and in on-base systems um, to be accelerated to the point where we can start really uh, providing an increased insurance, mission assurance immediately um, over what we're dealing with right now with uh, the vulnerabilities in the grid and, and, and very limited on-base um, portable generation uh, capability right now. What we believe, how the business model would ultimately benefit DOD, first of all, it cuts down on the number of contractors that are working. You have, in some cases, you've got an on-base electrical privatization contract, contractor maintaining the on-base systems. You've also got, you know, another contractor's working on ESPCs. You might even have something in the works for a long-term PPA. Unfortunately, from what we've seen, these are all stovepiped. So combining those, significantly, from our perspective, increases your buying potential and what you could accomplish when you accomplish all these, if you, if you put all these things into one potential deal um, and asking one entity, whether it be a utility company in partnership with an ESCO or an ESCO by itself, depending on where you're at with the regulated or unregulated market, what, what can one entity do to address conservation goals, to address security goals, to address modernization goals, and ultimately to address sustainability and, and to, to what degree you still want to incorporate as a priority, green energy goals. Lucian, could I just uh, insert a quick question from the audience here? We had a question on whether you're suggesting this be a sole source procurement via multiple authorities or whether this is a competitive bidding process. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it, it, all, it, it depends on what market you're in, regulated or unregulated. I believe that uh, I'm not sure how the first one out of the shoot could not be competitive. Uh, I believe uh, down the road there might be an opportunity or need to do a sole source if the, if the economics and the, and the, and the conditions uh, allowed it. Uh, I believe that based on my review of the authorities, there is the ability, the Secretary of Defense, um, to do a sole source. But I, believe, but I believe more strongly that in the beginning, particularly to get buy-in and to get an understanding of how we could actually carry this out, it probably would have to be a competitive solicitation. Thank you. Any other questions, Jamie, coming in? Uh, no. Okay. The goal here, and I think probably the most important feature would be the second, second from the bottom where you work with a single entity that has access to not just you know, what's going on with the generating source, but also all your on-base distribution systems. From my perspective, that will significantly decrease the, the, the load and the, and the stress on a facility energy manager 
knowing that they're working with one person they can call to address a whole range of issues, whether it be with a power outage or concerns with the off-base or on-base distribution, off-base lines being down, on-base lines being down, working with one person to manage all that. Again, really appreciate your questions coming in. That gives us an opportunity here to really uh, hone in on some of the details that I'm uh, that I may be inadvertently or, 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 or in some cases intentionally because it's still a concept I'm overlooking. But I definitely will appreciate your questions coming in as we're talking here. And Lucian, okay. I'll, I'll just maybe give you two quick ones right now. So one yeah. question is whether there's a role for the existing power providers or utilities to participate in the solution. Yeah, I believe so, and that's and and, and there there are uh, you would you would think they'd be one of the first ones that want to jump at this, and and I'd be for what I would love to see is some unsolicited proposals coming in from uh, from the current power providers on where they can extend their range of services onto a military installation. So yes, definitely I would believe that they would uh, want to stay on top of this and, and be the first to the trough um, for right. working with the local base. Right, and you can also imagine if this were a com competitive procurement, they may be part of a bid team along with developers and other uh, right. providers. And then one more question on the structure of these con uh, contracts. How are the baselines determined? So, for example, if electricity usage drops, how is that accounted for in the performance requirement? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question, and and I'm not sure. I mean, that really would need to be boiled down to uh, how the department wants to prepare that RFP. Uh, I have not gone as deep as I probably uh, could have on figuring out establishing a series of performance factors. No doubt they're the, probably the most important part of the RFP, um, but what we're working on right now is, is getting the department to start paying attention to that. So uh, I, I believe we're still about um, three to four months out from having that discussion with the services. Um, I, have, I have my ideas, but I, I, you know, obviously I wouldn't be the one writing the RFP. I, I don't know exactly. Uh, to what degree we'd want to, we would want to uh, throw those rate adjustments in there, throw those electricity load demands, because you know, uh, uh, power loads, particularly uh, as we're gaining and losing units with all these bases, we're seeing 10 to 15, 20 percent decreases or increases in in electrical usage, and how that would be accommodated within the construct of this deal. Um, you're right; it's a great question. I'm not sure we've really, uh, I've had, we've had a chance to really solve that one yet. Right, and there is some precedent, of course, with the energy savings performance contracts. We're setting baselines, projecting them into the future, and setting sort of a buffer around what the performer is expected to do. Yeah, so I think yeah. you're right. There's, some, there's certainly some ideas that are already out there in practice. Yeah, there's ideas, and to what degree they would be applied within, uh, I mean, really what it boils down to is making sure a, a, a military service can come up with a pretty comprehensive series of performance factors. Um, using the best practices, using the what's been done, but keying in, keying in, I believe, on on uh, on uh, uh, making sure that whatever they come up with performance factors is first of all achievable, but allows for uh, some type of capitalization tail to address some of the emerging requirements. So, uh, balancing performance factors with the need to uh, generate capital, I think, is where you'd have to find the balance. Uh, you'd really have to work on. Okay, thank you. So one of the things we want to end on this, uh, uh, the presentation on before we get to more questions is the fact that there are entities uh, in the United States who are already pursuing this. Um, the one that uh, we've been paying attention to most of all is what's going on right now at the Ohio State University uh, who uh, last year, uh, start, actually about two years ago, came up with the idea, but last year really started putting uh, uh, efforts into it through the, the, the first an RFI, then an RFP on looking at where an entity, private entity or a group or, or a team could meet their goals. Now their goals are um, providing for a sustainable power source um, and, and as well as reliability uh, to a very large campus of facilities. Um, and so they've been working, they started off with a series of, uh, of, uh, of responses. They're looking at a 50 year term um, and, and, and they're looking for some pretty pretty good performance factors as far as uh, operating, maintaining production, implementing energy conservation, which I you got to incorporate whoever would be doing an energy as a service would want to come forward with, hey, we can help you out, we can help carry out your conservation goals. 
and, uh, and also to meet sustainable, uh, or sustainable energy requirements that might be uh, unique to Ohio State. But, but they really did a good job of, of formulating what their priorities were going to be. Um, it has been a rough road for them. I've talked to some folks out there. Um, they've gone from uh, 44 responses uh, in June of last year. They're down now to 16s. I think they're actually down to three now. Uh, but they are working on trying to get some type of decision uh, planned uh, by or, or out to the uh, to their to the faculty and to their student body uh, by the end of 2016. So in the next few months, I've heard that might slip until early next year. Um, but that is their goal, and um, and they've learned a lot along the way. And, and I think uh, it's something that if the Department of Defense were to want to pursue this, they definitely would want to figure out what the lessons learned are from um, the Ohio State model, and to what degree that we they would their, their changes would have been made along the way. Um, the tough news for us right now is they're in a very sensitive part of the negotiations with the final vendors which makes um, open communication a little bit harder to do right now. Uh, I can't wait personally to talk to them once they make the award, to head back out there and figure out, okay, what did they do right, what did they do wrong, and then to take that back and making sure that we have the flexibility within our existing authorities to, to, to take those lessons learned and apply it to any type of pilot um, that, that the military service will want to work on. Okay, so um, as a summary here, and I, and I guess I've talked too fast because I was going to be talking until 2 o'clock, so I look forward to opening up the questions. Um, but I, the goal here, and I want and to make sure it's perfectly clear, we're not trying to, trying to educate the public energy as a service. We're trying to say, look, DOD needs to take a look at this. And the, probably the best thing that could come out of this session today is, is an open dialogue uh, between you all, uh, whoever is listening in, but more importantly, a reach out to the Department of Defense and asking, hey, we're interested in this. We believe this is probably a way ahead. Where, where do you need us to collaborate and cooperate? Um, uh, I personally haven't worked with DOD lawyers over the years. Uh, there's probably going to be a reluctance um, by DOD lawyers to press forward on something like this uh, without a clear authorization from Congress. Not sure they're going to get that. Um, so our goal is to get enough private sector interests in, uh, uh, involved to the point where DOD is taking some pretty good ideas in and saying, hey, you know what, this, we might be able to put something together. What we, we would like to have happen is an RFI and RFP to go out within the next uh, six to eight months. And I believe the Air Force might be you know, working on something in that direction um, for by we can actually fish out where there might be statutory impediments or where there might be policy impediments, or where there might be the potential of a scoring issue, then then we can further address in legislation in FY18 to help clear the path um, for um, getting actually getting out there with an RFP and out with an award. So we're still in preliminary stages, and we're still in the stage where I believe where DOD can be um, influenced and, and, is, and is receptive to seeing what private, the private sector would like to, to do in this area, particularly working within existing authorities. So the goal that Jamie and I have been working on over the last uh, few months is to um, try to, to, to get as many folks interested in this, to go through, provide you an understanding of where we're at currently with, with this uh, program, what DOD is up against, to help inform your decisions and your approach and how you might want to uh, engage with the services, knowing that they do have limited authority and they do have a tough time getting any deal um, through DOD lawyers or, through, or DOD contracting agents. But at, least, but at least to establish a collaborative environment where we might be able to see what is available and what can be done. Okay, great, thank you. And at, at that, yeah. Jamie, I don't know if you've got any more questions coming in, but I would love to hear from anybody who's listening in. Yeah, we do. Um, so it sounds like not everyone in our audience w uh, saw the READY RFP. Could you recap briefly what was included in that and what the yes. Air Force t intends to do? Yeah, sure thing. I'm going to go back to that slide. And Nicole did tell me how to go to the slides, but I couldn't figure it out, so I'm just going to have to. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay. So what, what the Air Force is really looking for is ideas from industry with this RFI. They gave out a basic problem set. Hey, help us get 
to more resilient and secure and reliable and, and efficient and cost-effective uh, energy source um, for uh, our critical functions on Beale Air Force Base. They pretty much left it at that. And if you go, and if you go to the RFP at the bottom or the RFI, uh, you can actually look up where what they got was a series of questions coming in from industry. Um, to what degree you rely on the SBCs? You know, what are you really asking for? And they did their best to provide answers. Um, but they're really looking for is a, um, a, an approach. They're looking for a private sector to suggest an approach to create resi a, a resilient on-base energy system and in, to include generation storage and, uh, and microgrid. Um, it, and, they, and they're really looking more for those ideas to come in. I believe even though the RFI closed on July 15th, I, I would bet that the, you know, Bobby Hughes and, and Mark Carell and, and uh, Sean Bennett, the guys over at the Air Force, are still, t uh, we're still willing to take ideas as far as uh, ultimately uh, how to improve the, the energy readiness and the most important thing for the Air Force is mission assurance to improve the mission assurance and to protect from a potential commercial power outage. They're not saying that there, there's a higher potential in California than other locations. All they're saying is Beale's got a, a unique set of missions that we want to see what can be done to improve the reliability and resilience uh, uh, for those critical missions. And that's really as far as the RFI went. Um, I've not personally uh, heard about all the range of responses. I know the Air Force is going through that. Um, but I also, if you want to get into real weeds, the real weeds of that, I definitely recommend you go into the uh, file uh, attachment at the bottom there um, because it does provide about a 10-page overview of Beale Force Base and what they're trying to get done. Great. Thank you. Got a couple more coming in here. Okay, there are also questions about how the Ohio State effort may be different from the Ready RFP. Can you recap that as well? Yeah, sure thing. So the Ohio State effort, uh, being a public university, um, incorporated performance factors and goals that were much more uh, concerned about um, uh, sustainability, about environmental issues, uh, a clean energy, uh, as, 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 as primary performance factors. The, the Ready initiative, uh, definitely request proposals or input from industry that would uh, uh, include clean energy initiatives, but only as one of three factors and, and not necessarily an, with a need to satisfy all three. So I believe that they, the Air Force, and, and again, I'm speaking for them, I'm, I'm hoping there might be some folks from the Air Force on the line or um, feel free to give Mark Carell a call. I believe the Air Force for this uh, ready initiative was more looking for the sustainable and, and, reli and reliable energy provided to critical functions. Again, sustainable being more the reliable, I should say, uh, in, out, in, in case of a commercial power outage, more the reliable energy provided to base installations without necessarily a priority placed on what the power generating source is. Thank you. Okay, so it sounds like responding to these RFIs is one way that industry can get involved. Uh, how, are, how else can industry help engage the government in this effort? Yeah, absolutely. I, I believe that there are um, ESCOs out there and utility companies who have taken the lead on, on preparing unsolicited proposals um, that they can provide to DOD. Uh, I know it's a lot of effort. It would be a lot of man hours and, uh, to do that, but I, I, I get the sense from the folks that I talk to um, that it is worth it, that, that this is a potential game changer, uh, particularly uh, um, uh, to address the fact that microgrids do offer a significant advantage for the future, but as it stands right now, DOD budgets cannot afford them. So if you, if you particularly if you're rolling a microgrid technology into an unsolicited proposal, I believe you're going to get a very warm reception for whatever military service you're proposing to uh, because they really do have a, a pressing national security need for which they cannot find a way forward with given um, constrained, current constrained budgets. 
That's right. And, and even short of uh, submitting an unsolicited proposal, I've found that not only the Air Force, but also the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps are very open to uh, taking meetings with industry and just hearing your thoughts informally. So there are a lot of ways that you can weigh in on this for sure. That's correct. And not just going through the, you know, as you know, the Army and the Air Force, their energy shops are combined resources recently. It's not just talking to the shops, but it's also talking to the consultants and the folks who are working with them. I know the Army has a, 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 a very engaged and aggressive and proactive team working on behalf of the Army of Energy Initiatives um, to help them out. So it's not just directly engaging with the staff themselves, but also talking to the folks who are, in some cases, more energy, um, commercial energy professionals and have the expertise that maybe you, you might not find as much within the uh, Army offices. And, and by the way, if anybody here from one of the offices of the services, please don't send bad notes. I, it's just a matter of there are there is some private sector expertise, which has already um, uh, been beneficial, uh, just like the housing privatization program used private sector experts to help with the financing and with the, and with, uh, the crafting of the deals. Thank you. We've also got a question, Lucian, about BRAC. Uh, how does the looming yeah. you know, BRAC scheduled for around 2020 impact the appeal of a long-term agreement? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so real quick, and uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, that's another uh, air, air area that I've been really working on hard. Um, to what degree uh, uh, these deals might impact an installation that's affected by BRAC is interesting, and in some cases, it's controversial. Um, it's, there's a realization that even in the military housing privatization program, there were BRAC guarantees that may ultimately cost the department a lot of money in order to get them out from under those guarantees and be able to close the base they might want to close. So I, I don't believe that this initiative should be looked at as a way to brag proof a base. Uh, I do believe that um, one of the factors in military value um, with, for the BRAC criteria is the cost of operations. And there is a wide range of initiatives that communities and, and states are working with on, on their military installations to reduce the cost of operations. And there are other authorities available too. So in that regard, yes, I do believe that if you came up with, with a, a method, particularly um, in those particular areas with, where you have a very high cost per kilowatt hour, that you could come in with a proposal that would at least add that at that kilowatt, uh, cost per kilowatt hour or slightly higher, provide a whole range of additional um, resources and capital improvements that you probably would do, a, it would be a great um, way to improve the military value for that base. I, I know that's exactly what we're pursuing um, at a particular location in Oklahoma where we're looking at uh, somehow developing a, a distributed power generation plant powered by natural gas um, that ultimately could power all the functions on that base um, and significantly increase its military value as you compare it to other like functions around the Department of the Army. So I believe that that has a potential to have an impact on BRAC, um, but I'd be, I, 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 it'd be tough for me to say right now to what degree the department would look at that and, and, and to what degree it would it'd be a, a big player in whether a base closes, uh, increases its size, or is realigned. Okay, thank you. Lucian, you also mentioned the idea of combining ESIPs or other federally funded programs with third-party finance opportunities. Can you talk a little bit about how that might work given the lead time that's usually required for federal funding? Yeah, sure. And, and, that, and, and we had the same issue. This is, this is also lessons learned from the housing privatization program. Uh, it did take a year or two to work on a pro forma and work out the debt uh, service, work out the financing and all those things. They went with a deal. Um, we did, for a couple of years there, provide um, some flexibility in the military construction accounts to go ahead and, 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 and fund that. So it didn't necessarily um, always rely on a specific appropriation for a specific housing privatization deal. We created a fund that, for which uh, contributions could be made by the military departments, for which then can be turned around and used as, cap, uh, as contributions to, to, um, at the final signature of these deals. Um, it's not that difficult to create a similar funding mechanism um, for, uh, uh, for ESIP where you could transfer ESIP dollars which are provided by Congress for energy conservation improvement um, with some slight adjustments. You could dump that into a fund that then would be readily available um, to the services in order at the time when you're signing the deal to go ahead and, and make that transfer of, of, of capital. Okay, great. 
And then it might also be helpful to talk a little bit about how the government might select facilities that are good candidates for energy as a service. You yeah, did mention okay. a little bit about the benefits of regulated markets. I think there are benefits to deregulated markets as well in terms of the provider's ability to participate assets in the market and, and revenues from doing so. But can you talk about a few other factors to consider? It, it, it's a fantastic question. That really gets to the heart of the matter here. It's okay, fine. So if the Department of Defense were to do this, any one of the services, you know, where would you want to do it? Obviously, you want to do it someplace where you have a relatively currently high cost of kilowatt hour that provides you an opportunity to get some buying power out of a 30-year PPA. Um, you also need to combine that with, uh, I hate to say this, probably an unregulated market to begin with until we got smart about this and then you make the transition to a regulated market. You would also have to look at what bases already have um, utilities privatization deals in place and what degree could you work with the current UP provider or would you need to terminate that or would you just work around it? I mean, I think those are all factors that would need to go into a selection and installation. Um, I, I think the Air Force already did that to some extent with Beale. I do believe that the Navy and the Army, who are, have not been as aggressive on utilities privatization, probably offers better opportunities to take a look at uh, where this might be effective, particularly the Navy, because they've got relatively small number of installations with a very high concentration of users of, of power and industrial activities. Probably, and not only that, they've really been, um, uh, I should say, standoffish on using UP, utility privatization. Probably the Navy might offer a location that could be um, easily uh, 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 incorporated into an energy service RFP particularly if they need an, a microgrid, which I know the, the Army, I'm sorry, the, the Navy is very aggressive on pursuing microgrids. They do believe that is the way toward energy conservation. So I think it's a combination of, of the Navy wanting to pursue certain types of capital improvements combined with their just inherent nature of their activities and the availability of, of on-base uh, assets to convey that would probably offer up a better opportunity for, for energy as a service than others. Uh, but it does boil down to a lot of factors, and that's something that the services are going to need to take a look at, you know, what those candidates are. Um, there are stories around the, the, the services today where they do have uh, uh, pressing power requirement needs from emerging missions that are outside the BRAC process. Folks, for the, for the people who don't have been paying attention, you know, BRAC is occurring every day as we are building up cyber missions, as we are relocating uh, uh, functions, as we're drawing down brigades, as we're standing up new weapon systems, the F-35 or the B-21, and all those, uh, all those requirements are driving uh, changes in the electrical loads that in some cases taxing existing electrical loads. So that'd be another, another opportunity for energy as a service to step in and, 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 and quickly take care of that need um, and, and, and without necessarily having to spend a, a lot of milk on dollars. Thank you. I just want to encourage the audience to uh, go ahead and submit any final questions as we're winding down here. Lucian, I do have a few more on Ohio State, so I just wanted to clarify that the Ohio State opportunity is not a federal opportunity and there will be no DOD funding for it. I think Lucian made this clear, but I just want to make sure that we didn't, uh, we didn't confuse that. So we included it here as an example, both for government and for the audience, of how energy as a service can work, but it's not a federally funded opportunity. Okay, I think we've covered most of the questions for the audience and, and mine. <laughs> um, I'll just give one more minute here. I would like to, I mean, i take a moment here. I think the Air Force has really embraced this. And um, I, I believe that Mark uh, Corral has taken a personal investment in this. And if you look at, uh, he's already gone public with the fact that uh, Energy as a Service does offer a, a way forward for the Air Force. Um, the goal here is now is to see um, at what point uh, does the Army and the Navy uh, uh, look at this as well um, to see what can be done. More importantly is where, when, and where efforts can be consolidated among the services. Part of the problem we're dealing with right now is that each of the services are, are addressing their energy needs separately. So you'll see in some locations where you've got, it, you've got commensurate uh, and, and in some cases incompatible initiatives underway in the same region um, and in some cases being performed by the same utility for the different services. 
There's nothing in the law or in DOD policies that says that the services can't get together and bundle their requirements regionally to, to, uh, to be able to work with one entity on being able to power uh, multiple installations in a region. In some cases, it makes a lot more sense. So part of the concern we have here, and we want to uh, uh, continue to advocate for um, uh, folks approaching the services collectively and saying, hey, look, I got a deal for you that will, that will take care of the power needs for, for the entire state of Washington, or I'm just using it as an example, but, but a whole group of bases, and it's just a matter of you all working together to, to, to work with us on an, R, uh, on a, on an RFP um, that goes beyond just the stovepipes of particular authorities or particular installations. Great, thank you. I did want to ask if Sean Bennett from the Air Force is on. Yes, I am. Okay, great. Sean, could you weigh in with some of the Air Force's upcoming plans on this topic? Yes, thanks, um, and thanks, Jamie and, and Lucian, for uh, hosting this webinar and raising this issue. Um, certainly, something that the Air Force is, is very interested in. And, and Lucian, as you mentioned, Mr. Carell has taken a particular interest, and he has asked uh, me and the team to. Uh, look to issue an RFI on to demonstrate energy as a service as a concept on an installation. Um, and so we are in the process of looking, uh, identifying a site, identifying an installation on an Air Force base to demonstrate this concept um, and hopefully go out at the beginning of next year. So uh, look forward to that. We're, we're certainly seeking industry input, um, looking at the OSU RFI process, RFP process, and, and looking to learn from them as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Sean. Any final comments, Lucian? Um, no, I really appreciate everyone's attention today, and um, and, and 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 I really want to extend a, a, a sincere appreciation to SAME for hosting this, and I look forward to further discussions. Um, I highly encourage everybody on the on the webinar to attend the Small Business Conference in Atlanta. Um, in November. It's a great forum to continue this discussion and dialogue with senior DOD leaders, uh, both the Corps of Engineers and military services. Um, for those of us who have been to the FBC, we also know the services use that opportunity to bring all their engineers in from around the country for training seminars. So the combination of having uh, all the service engineers there combined with what SAME does to put together an, an amazing event um, is a great uh, opportunity for us to continue this discussion and hopefully uh, beyond the halls of SAME we can uh, take it to the halls of the Pentagon and, uh, and start pushing this initiative forward. I, I do believe personally, based on what I've seen working these issues for 10 years, this is a very powerful and effective way to move the ball forward, particularly to address some of the energy security needs we have as a nation. All right, thank you. And Lucian, I would like to extend a warm thank you to you as well for a very good discussion today. On behalf of SAME and the Energy and Sustainability Subcommittee, we really appreciate everybody's participation, and I hope this webinar has been useful. If you have any additional questions, you can submit them via email to Nicole Matthews, and her address is nmathews at same.org. And this concludes our webinar. You can now disconnect, and have a wonderful day.